Well, here we are today, continue our study in the four priorities, and we're on chapter number 24 today. We're moving right along. Um, the chapter talks about uh, methods of evangelism or methods of sharing the good news about Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection, and coming again, which we talked about last week a little bit. But what I want to do today, and you see I've got my, my board here, I'm going to do a little drawing and talking, uh, and some of this is somewhat redundant in the chapter, but I want to draw it out for you like I have done hundreds and hundreds of times with people in my office um, and in meetings where there have been crowds of people. Uh, but I want to couch it in a story, a true story that happened in my office a couple years ago. So with that in mind, here we go. So one of our uh, luncheons uh, that we do in Dallas called the Gathering of Men Luncheons, a young guy came up to me afterwards and said, boy, I love the meeting today. He said, could I come by and talk to you sometime? I said, I'd love for you to. So a week or so later, he came in and we visited and, and he said, well, John, here's the deal. He said, my dad lives in Charlottesville, Virginia. He said he is 70 years old and he said he is a 70-year-old atheist. And what even makes it more difficult is he has cancer. And he said, I love Jesus Christ. Uh, and I want to be with my dad for eternity. But the way it stands right now, we're not going to be together. And so as we visit, I offered to uh, go to Charlottesville, Virginia and meet with him. And that was on a Friday. On Monday, I received an email. And my friend said, uh, my dad said, well, if it's that important, then I'll come to Dallas. So... The next day on Tuesday, precisely 10.15, in came my friend Rob, the son, and Bob, the dad, who claimed to be an atheist. So as they sat down, this is kind of how the conversation went. I said, uh, well, Bob, I said, uh, I appreciate you coming. Why did you come here? He said, well, because my uh, son asked me to come, and I love my son. He said, it's important. I needed to be here. I said, well, that's a good reason. I said, second question. I said, uh, what do you believe? Just a generic question. He said, well, thought for a moment. He said, I guess I believe in, in the basic uh, goodness of humanity. And I kind of chuckled. And I said, well, you don't know some of the humanity I know. And he laughed about that. Third thing, I said, Bob, I said, do you believe there's a God? He looked down for a moment. Then he looked back up and he said, not sure about that. I said, well, thanks, Bob, because now I know where to start. And so I'm going to give you some of the conversation and then tell you how I introduced him to my friend Jesus. So I said, Bob, what we need to talk about from where you're coming from is a whole question of existence. How did everything get here? I said, there are only three possible answers that mankind has ever come up with on how everything came into existence. Number one, I said, everything that exists came out of absolutely nothing. So I pointed to the wall behind me, and I said, if that were a black blackboard, I said, what this basic position says is that everything just came out of nothingness. I said, no one holds that position because it doesn't give you any specific answers to the specific questions like, why are we the way we are? Why can we communicate? Why can we think? Why can we have emotions? Why can we be creative, etc." Second possible answer, I said, Bob, is everything that exists has always existed, but with possible cycles within. I said, so what this one is basically saying, in formula style, it's time plus chance equals existence, or what you see. I said, this is where evolution would fall. And again, I'm going to kind of curtail this some, but I said, Bob, I said, Darwin, at the end of his life, it is reported that he said on his deathbed, he said, I have been a proponent all these years that everything eventually evolved from an earthworm. But what bothers me is this. If I, Darwin, came from an earthworm, then how can I trust myself to come up with a theory that explains the existence of mankind? And so the report is he died depressed. The third possible answer is there's a personal beginning. So I said, Bob, I said, when you flew over here the other day from Charlottesville, I said, uh, you saw uh, a change in topography. You saw the lush land up where you are in Charlottesville. You came down here to Texas, where it's, it's at least where we live, it's kind of flat, dry often. Uh, but I said, if there were a God, 
how would he make all this? What would he be like? What would he have to, what would some of his characteristics be? Well, I said, well, he'd have to be creative. I said, yeah. He'd have to be powerful, correct. He would have to have intellectual ability. I agree with that. And I said, Bob, are you, do you have any intellectual ability? He said, well, I pride myself in being, you know, semi-bright. And I said, well, uh, how about creativity? Well, I'm to some degree creative. I said, and you can communicate and you think and so forth. And I said, it's interesting the Bible says that we have been made in the image of God. After his likeness, we have been fashioned or made. So if he's creative and we're creative and he has an intellect and thinks and communicates and we communicate, I said, Bob, here God is with all those characteristics and here we are with many of the similar characteristics, there's a match. So Bob, what I'm proposing to you is the third possible answer is that we have been made in the image of God. There is a God based upon that third possible answer. So I said, just think about that. So then I said, the second question I want to talk about, other than the question of existence, how do we get here, is uh, why in the world is the world so screwed up? And he said, boy, it really is, isn't it? I said, well, let me give you a little history lesson. I said, in the very beginning, the Bible teaches, I said, you may not believe the Bible, but let me just give you what it says, is that God and mankind, I'm just going to use the word man, men and women, were in an intimate relationship with the God of the universe. But then, we also, and by the way, every need they had was met. There was no disease. There were no tsunamis. There were no tornadoes. There were no natural disasters. There was no cancer. There were no germs. It was perfect. But God set up a rule. Not many rules, a rule. He said, you keep the rule, everything will be cool. You break the rule, there are going to be consequences. So one day these people woke up and decided, and I'm not sure how, that they wanted to run their own life. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They broke the rule. As a result of that, there were four consequences that impacted them, but also impact all of us today. So let me tell you what those are. Number one, they were cut off from God, cut off and severed. So no longer were they in that intimate relationship with God, but now they've got this gigantic chasm that separates them from the God that made them and provided for them. So that was the first thing. And I've reached over to a lamp by me and I pulled the plug out. The light went out. I said, Bob, why the light go out? Because he said, it's unplugged from the power of source or the source of power. I said, exactly. So number two, they then and us today were cut off from ourselves. And by that, what I mean is that none of us have it all together. Psychologically, uh, mentally. Uh, I said, Bob, we're all a little goofy. And I said, if you're unplugged from the God that made you, that makes you whole, a whole person, I said, then there's no way we're going to be whole in terms of how we look at ourselves. I said, it is rampant in our country, the disease of low self-esteem. And people struggle all their lives trying to be okay. So the third thing that happened is that we're cut off from others. And not only were they estranged from each other, but we're estranged from each other. I said, in, in the city where I live here in Dallas, there's about a 50% divorce rate. In one county in, in Florida, it's 62.1% divorce rate. I said, why do we have to have attorneys? Because we just can't give a word and keep it. Why are there wars? Because we can't get along with one another. If you're disconnected from the God that made you, there's no way in the world you're going to have it together with yourself, and there's no, there, therefore, any way you're going to be able to relate well and effectively with others. So the fourth thing is everything in creation on the planet has been thrown off kilter so that now there are natural disasters. Now there are horrible diseases. And on and on the list goes of evidences that our planet is in disarray. The environment is in disarray. So Bob looked at that and I said, well, Bob, the question then becomes, is there any hope? Are we just stuck? And so then I said to Bob, I said, most people try to get to God by several ways. One, by just being good. So if I'm good enough, then maybe God will take a liking to me and I'll make it to heaven. 
But the question is, how good do you have to be? Because God is 100% perfect. And he will not allow anybody in a relationship with him, an intimate relationship, who's less than 100% perfect. So that means I've got to be perfect. I can't be perfect. So we come up with different ideas, different cults and other belief systems. But the major one in our world is religion. And I said, Bob, all the religions in the world are pretty much the same. This is what they say. Keep the rules of our religion, cross your fingers, and hopefully someday you'll make it to whatever they call their heaven, nirvana or whatever it is. But again, the problem is, how good do you have to be? And secondly, you never know this side of death whether you've been able to keep the rules of that religion well enough to make it. So, is there another way? I said, Bob, you like football. He said, man, I love football. I said, okay, Bob. I said, I said, in football, there are four downs. I said, let me use this to help you remember what I'm getting ready to tell you. I said, down one, God looked down. And when he looked down, he saw the mess we were in. He could have turned his back and said, I'm out of here. But he didn't. Down two. Jesus came down. Lived on the planet for 33 years. When he spoke, people listened. When he touched people, they were made whole. It is an undeniable fact that the person of Jesus Christ lived on this planet. He claimed to be the Son of God. God in a body. Nothing less. Third down. The reason he came, though, wasn't just to heal or to provide food, but he came to make people whole. And how did he do that? Jesus laid down his life on a cross. So why did he do that? I said, Bob, why did he do that? I said, he did that because we have a problem. The Bible says the problem is sin. And I said, Bob, sin basically is not the little things we do that are wrong. It's much deeper. I said, there's something in me that wants to do what I want to do, not what God wants to do. That's called my sinful bent or nature. Sin basically is a spiritual cancer. Something deep in me that, again, wants to go my own way. The scripture says in Romans Bob, I said 3.23, for all of sin and come short of what God expects. And then Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin, what I earn because I've offended God and not done what he wants and lived like he wants, is the penalty is death. So there's wages, there's a penalty that's due as a result of offending God. So Jesus Christ, God's plan, God in the body, hangs on a cross to take on himself the penalty that I was due. Now, it's almost too good to be true, isn't it? But there's a fourth down. I said the fourth down says every knee must bow down. There comes that point when you've got to cry uncle and say, I can't make it, Lord, on my own. I can never be good enough. Thank you for what you've done for me. And I want you to take up residence in my life, clean me up, and from this day forward, help me to become the man or the woman you want me to be. Well, I drew a circle, and I wish I had more space here. I drew a big circle. I said, Bob, if that were your life, and this cross represents everything about Jesus I just told you and what he did for you and me, the Bible says he needs to live in your life. Is he in your life or out here? And Bob said, well, he's out there. And so I said, well, Bob, if you'd like for him to come in your life, I'm going to pray a little prayer. So I asked Rob and Bob to bow their heads. And this was the prayer that I prayed. And I said, just pray it between you and the Lord and repeat after me. Nothing magical about the words, but it's your heart he's looking at. And so I simply prayed, dear Lord, thank you for what uh, you've done for us and your son Jesus Christ by dying on the cross. Uh, I pray now that you've come into my life clean me up, and from this day forward, help me to become the man you want me to be. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, then I looked up, and they were sitting across a little table in front of me, and they had their heads bowed. I thought, maybe they went to sleep, but they didn't. <laughs> so I looked over, and I said, Bob, 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 did you pray that prayer? And Bob very slowly raised his head with tears running down his cheek, and the 70-year-old atheist shook his head. Yes. He gets up, he's hugging his dad. I had never witnessed anything like it in my life. Four months later, Bob passed away and went to be with the Lord for eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not die, should not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. Bob had it. And so when I share who Jesus Christ is and what he's done, that's kind of what I do almost every time. I mean, it varies somewhat with the individual, the questions they ask, because you need to be sensitive to those and respond to those as best you can. So my challenge to you is, first of all, is Jesus in your life? If he's not, pray a prayer like Bob prayed. If he is in your life, then you need to get ready to be able to articulate to your friends who your best friend is, Jesus. Are you ready to do that? You think about that real hard.